ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the September meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Are there any uh, non-members or members of the public here? We'd, oh, box. we'd like to know that you're welcome. Tonight we have an uh, extremely packed meeting. Uh, we have lots of pretty pictures to look at, observation reports. We have uh, lots of ideas on what new objects to observe tonight. And we have a whole bunch of people giving reports on what fun they've had recently in astronomy. I don't know if they want to say yeah, 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 or encourage you, but I've heard of that. The encourage part. Um, we might run, run somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes of overtime because we have so much material. So I'd ask the speakers to not ramble on like me. Okay, first of all, we're going to do the observation reports. This is a, a section where uh, people have been doing observing our introduction. I to come up and show you the work that they've been doing. Uh, first to speak, because I'm already busy here yakking. At Starfest on uh, August the 18th, I was busy observing a, uh, a uh, IO transit. And I was kind of noticing that um, Danny Mead and uh, Europa were kind of getting close together. So I was wondering, gee, are they actually going to occult each other? So I got my bottom viewer and tossed in some high power eyepieces. I totally screwed up. I wound up using a thousand power by accident. That's ludicrous power. But as it turns out, ah, damn. <laughs> we got the animation to work. It's okay. We want to hear that. The animation. Yeah, work. Oh. Okay, this will work. Imagine. <laughs> Back up. The enemy slowly moves here, and it covers about that much of Europa. Oops. And I actually saw it. The scene was unbelievably good, and I had lucked out and did a really good job of coloring my telescope. And while they were overlapping, I could see that they were different colors. Europa is distinctly blue in comparison to Danny Mead's gray. This is really a cool sight. I've never seen that bigger sight before. I thought it was fabulously rare. Turns out it's not as rare as I thought. This is from Sky News Magazine. The current issue, they have a list of other mutual drone beam events. The will see I.O. called the new uh, Jupiter four clouds on the 8th and possibly do some of the things. So have a look at your Sky News magazine. It was tons of fun, by the way. Highly recommend. It's in the Observer's Handbook as well, I tell you. And it's also on the RSC calendar, I believe. So next up is called the Paul Commission. Would you like to speak from your chair, Paul? Yeah, OK. This is the uh, last month's uh, challenge object, uh, uh, 50, NGC 5866 in Draco. The secret here is not overexposure. If you overexpose, you'll get that. That lane will be covered up with light. And so uh, I tried a few times. This is not, by the way, this is the final product. I tried a few times to get this exact effect. Okay, what next? Oh, that's, uh, this is uh, NGC 6618, known as uh, M17. This is in Sagittarius. It's a, uh, uh, an emission nebula that's uh, 5,910 light years away. Uh, this is very similar to M42, the Orion Nebula. It's a uh, birthplace of uh, stars. It's a, a, a young uh, sort of a kindergarten for stars right here. This, this took 16 minutes of exposure. I get stacked with a 14 inch and uh, uh, as big uh, uh, 10 XME. This is a beautiful object to look at visually, too. It's not just pretty on Oh, visually. yes. It's visually, it's lovely. Very nice. Okay, next. Next is uh, Gary Boyle. Gary? Nice, Stella. And yes, with those occultations, obviously, didn't read last month's article on E News, my monthly sky this month, and I did have a timetable. Uh, just one photo I have of first time I've ever caught the moons with, with Jupiter. I think it was August 23rd or 24th. Exceptional night of uh, great scene conditions. Um, a lot of good detail on, on, uh, on the moon. on on Jupiter, that is. Uh, did anyone see yesterday morning, 12.30 uh, a.m., when all four moons disappeared? Yes. Yeah. That was something else. That's, you don't see no moons at all. Great. And that's it, folks. Thank, thank you, Gary. Next is uh, Sanjeev. I believe Sanjeev has five beautiful images for us to look at. <coughs> okay, thanks, Attila. Um, well, August was actually not a bad month compared to what we've had so far this summer. Uh, this shot is, uh, of course, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, I did this about three weeks ago uh, at a site about an hour west of the city. Um, this is with my DSLR. The, uh, the, f the field here is about, oops, what did I do? Where's the pointer? You can, you can just say next slide and it magically takes care of it. Where's the pointer? Oh, there's the pointer on that one. Oh, okay. 
Oops. Sorry. Okay, I don't have a pointer on this thing. So um, the field here is, is uh, six degrees wide. So this is similar to a binocular field, except that it's upside down. Usually you would see it upside down in the binoculars, which is the correct way, but in photos we're so used to seeing it this way that I've flipped the image upside down. You can see the two satellite galaxies as well, M M110 and M31, M32, the same image. Okay. Um, this is all, and that was shot with a 200 millimeter lens. Uh, it's a zoom lens at 200 millimeters. This is the same lens I used. This is, um, again, a six degree wide field. We're looking pretty much overhead now at, at uh, Cygnus. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this star here is, is Deneb, um, and this is the North American Nebula, and that's the Pelican Nebula over here, and, and this is the Cygnus star field. Now this, my camera is just a daytime DSLR, so it doesn't pick up as much of the red that you would normally see around here. Um, this, you want, I want you to focus on this area here. This is um, called the Cygnus wall. It's, it's an area, of, it's a, this whole thing is an emission nebula. This area is very active. The next image is gonna be a close-up close shot of that. This is the Cygnus wall. It's that area I just showed you. This part here is, is the Gulf of Mexico area, North American Nebula. Um, this, this is about half a degree wide, but it's about, probably about five or six light years across. And this was shot from my backyard. Um, and the reason I was able to do it from ba my backyard is because I use an H-alpha filter, which has the effect of blocking out um, most of the moonlight as well as the li uh, sky glow from light pollution. Um, but the DSLR shots require dark skies. My preference really is to shoot under dark skies. So this is what I did under dark skies, about three hours north of, of Ottawa. Um, this shot, I, wanted, I really wanted to go out and, and shoot the, the central bulge of the galaxy, and um, I wasn't able to do it very well because what happened was the moon was still interfering here. You can see a lot of moon glow here. So this is looking south uh, into Sagittarius. You can see the Sagittarius teapot right here. Okay, and then... The, the three brightest areas of the Milky Way that we see when looking south, this, is, this big area here is called the Great Sagittarius Star Cloud. And up here is M24, which is Messier thought was an object, but really it's just a star cloud. And this here is the Scutum star, star Cloud. And you can see the pipe nebula here. This is the horse. Um, this bulge is the bulge that goes into Ophiuchus. So this is sort of the central bulge of the galaxy. It's like a, seeing ha a flying saucer uh, edge on, and we're seeing about half of it. The other half has disappeared below the horizon. Again, the moon was just setting, but if I had waited longer for the moon, I would have lost my horse. So I, I, I kept the horse. Um, this is my last shot for tonight. This is, uh, again, at the same place. Uh, it's called La Verandry Forest Reserve, about three hours north of here. And there's an abandoned airstrip there. This, this is, uh, um, with both of these last two shots were with a 24 millimeter lens. So we're looking at about 50 degrees of sky, looking south. This star here is Altair. And you can see the tip of the teapot here. So what we're looking at really is about as a 50 degrees of sky, and we're looking at the galaxy kind of edge on as it's starting to set. This thing here is a scutum star cloud. You can see um, M16 and M17 up here, and a few of the other glob uh, globulars in Sagittarius as well. And that's with my DSLR. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, so that's, uh Somebody asked a question. That's uh, two eight-minute eight minute exposures stacked. Uh, the first one was one eight-minute exposure at ISO 800. Thank you. Next is uh, John Thompson. John? I believe this is the first time I actually captured a meteor when trying to. In the past, I've captured a couple of sporadics at non-shower uh, non times, but what I was doing here, I followed uh, what Pierre Martin did last month. He put a timer on the camera and set it up to do an hour's worth of 10-second exposures, but the last uh, 40 or 50 of them were wiped out by, by the uh, oncoming uh, dawn. In fact, you can see to the right-hand side, it's brighter because of the twilight coming in there. But you can see to the right, or sorry, to the left of the image is, um, do you have a pointer? Oh, is, so where's the, there, there's Cassiopeia, the W, sort of vertical like there. Uh, I, uh, the double cluster down here, so you can see that the radiant is sort of down here below the double cluster in Perseus. And that's out of 200 pictures that actually came out 
that's the one that captured a meteor. It's interesting, mm -hmm. interesting the green color, though. Was that your first meteor captured? Uh, the first one intentionally captured. I've had picked up <laughs> sporadics <laughs> occasionally, but when I've actually tried with film, it never happened. So, but I, I took 200 images to capture one. <laughs> so. that, that's a good ratio. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Very good. Um, this is Jupiter. Um, not much else to say, I guess. How many Jupiters do you see? This is two pictures of Jupiter. Actually, this was a. Oops, what happened? This is. Uh, actually, this was a, on a night of uh, pretty good seeing, so uh, I think it. Uh, it's about as, much, as good as you can expect, I guess. It's still only about 30 degrees up, so uh, it's pretty hard to see too much detail. Uh, okay, next one. So, okay, so here is, uh, this is really bad seeing, but uh, what was cool here is uh, two satellites and their shadows. So you can see uh, Europa and uh, Ganymede. So interesting, you can see that uh, Europa is dark when it's near the middle and gets light as it gets near the limb. Uh, about an hour, I guess. So, why does one moon appear dark and the other light? That's just their intrinsic color? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ganymede is uh, pretty big, but it's kind of dark. And uh, Europa is brighter, and Io is really bright. So, they have different, different I brightnesses. I was watching it visually. And when they're not up in front of the disk of the planet, they both seem to yeah, because you're because Ganymede is a lot bigger. Uh, but uh, yeah, against the planet, Ganymede is significantly darker. Okay, next. Uh, so, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, Mars, <laughs> um, and uh, again, it's about uh, five and a half arc seconds now. So. Pretty small, but it's gradually getting bigger. Not much bigger, it's only gonna get up to about uh, 14 and a half arc seconds later on. Uh, well, that's it, I guess. You can see the, uh, oops, there we go. I guess my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Excellent. Hi there. So uh, I was observing uh, with Lee McDonald on uh, Thursday, August 27th, and what we were looking for was the, uh, uh, the occultation of the uh, bright star Antares, the uh, main star in the constellation of Scorpius, and an occultation by the moon, meaning the moon would pass from some regions of Canada and the world. You'd see the moon pass in front of, uh, of Antares and block its light out. Where we're located, there was no indication that there was supposed to be uh, an occultation. But as we watched, uh, we picked uh, the moon up around uh, quarter past five, and by about uh, 5.30, we could also see Antares. But there was a lot of wispy cloud moving in and out. So we watched Antares come across. Okay, we'd be down here. We've got everything flipped backwards because of his funny eyepieces and everything, but all right. So we watched Antares come across, and he was, uh, Lee was observing through his 10-inch uh, telescope. He also had his 70 millimeter yeah. piggybacked on top of it. I was looking through that eyepiece. And at the same moment, uh, just 10 seconds before 5.58 p.m., we both saw Antares uh, wink out. It was just for, uh, for a second or two, and then it was back on. And it was nothing like uh, how it had been coming, coming in out of the clouds. So we are convinced that we observed a, uh, an occultation a lunar graze uh, right there. And what we think it is, is uh, on the north, this is the north limb of the moon down here. Uh, and it was librated, meaning tipped toward us a bit more. It was likely uh, a crater rim, possibly from the crater Peary. All right. Cool. Thank you, Brian. Next is Pierre Martin. He has a report on the Perseid meter shot. Oh, okay. Okay, well, I, I uh, hope uh, that some of you had a chance to see the uh, Perseids this year because it was, um, it turns out the Perseids uh, uh, certainly produce an above average uh, display. 
Uh, it was the, uh, the best uh, Parisian shower since the uh, early 1990s. And uh, we can uh, thank uh, Saturn for steering the uh, dusty core of the uh, Perseids uh, in our direction. So uh, what's actually kind of cool is I took this uh, chart from the International Meteor Organization where the, uh, this shows uh, data collected from um, observers all around the world, uh, essentially thousands of uh, Perseids. Uh, and what we see is a profile of the entire shower. So uh, the, uh, there's actually three peaks, which is uh, pretty cool. It, I don't remember having uh, seen this before for uh, the Perseids. This here was the, uh, the first night centered right on uh, uh, the uh, five, uh, four o'clock in the morning. It was uh, uh, the uh, part of the material shed by Comet Swift Total back in 1610. And we see this uh, central uh, peak here. And we're gonna move to the next slide because I, what I did is I just used a program to smoothen out the uh, error bars so that we can see a bit more clearly what happened. So we, there's our three peaks, our sharp one at 4 a.m. on August 12th. And then this large one right here was uh, caused by the, um, the main core of the uh, dust stream that we got uh, during the daytime, so we didn't get to see that. But what's actually pretty cool is that the following night, there was this uh, nice uh, sharp peak as well. So uh, for uh, Ottawa, we actually turned out to uh, have uh, both nights uh, clear. So it gives us a chance to see these features. The first night actually had uh, some pretty low activity most of the night, and it wasn't until after 3.30 that the rate suddenly shot straight up and produced that sharp uh, peak. So uh, on the next uh, slide, We'll see my uh, photo results from the uh, first night. And there we go, that's the, um, what I did is I uh, set up my camera, my DSLR, um, a Canon uh, 30D in this case, um, to take uh, uh, 20 seconds exposures all night long in the same area of the sky uh, using a 16 millimeter uh, lens, uh, full, fully wide open at f2.8. Uh, so uh, every exposure, uh, most of them, uh, the hundreds of exposures that I accumulated, uh, most of them do not have any meteors. But the ones I, where I did find meteors, I took these uh, frames and then I stacked them together in software to create this uh, composite. So a lot of, some of these bright meteors that you see are uh, pretty much all happen right near 4 o'clock in the morning near that first uh, sharp peak that we had from, uh, from the outburst. Uh, next slide. Uh, there is a second night's uh, result which uh, turned out to be a lot more active uh, overall throughout the entire night. It was actually uh, quite exciting. Uh, this, uh, again, the same uh, setup, my um, uh, 30, uh, Canon 30D with a 16 millimeter lens. And uh, you can see th this is actually quite a wide area of the sky where all the meteors seem to be coming from the radiant right about here. And you can even see one meter that's almost head on. This little uh, thing right here is a Perseid right next to the radiant. And just for reference, uh, there's uh, Perseus, the double cluster is right here, and uh, Cassiopeia upside down right over here. And Ursa Minor would be down here. So it gives you a bit of a scale of the, uh, the sky. And the reason why it's a lot brighter in this area is because uh, unfortunately it was uh, quite uh, moonlit uh, during the, the uh, peak of the shower. The moon is actually just off the corner here, so it actually lit up a good part of the sky. And uh, despite all the moonlight, uh, the uh, Perseids produced uh, quite a nice show. And the second night turned out to be most active around two in the morning where there were moments where I was seeing several Perseids every minute and sometimes uh, simultaneous meteors dropping. And it was actually quite, uh, quite a bright uh, display, which surprised me considering the amount of moonlight up in the sky. Uh, next one, please. And I had also a second camera also doing short exposures, uh, but with um, not as wide of a uh, wide angle of the lens. This is a 35 millimeter that was uh, centered on uh, Cygnus, which we see Deneb right here, uh, Cygnus, and uh, even uh, just a bit of the uh, North American uh, nebula showing up. Oh, yeah. So I, uh, uh, because of the, the much uh, smaller uh, field of view, less meteors uh, occurred there, but the ones that do, did show up, you can really see the, uh, the amount of colors, uh, which is kind of cool as a meteor plunges into the atmosphere and uh, different uh, chemicals uh, from the, uh, the particle is burning through the atmosphere. It actually changes uh, color and you get this uh, coloration uh, showing up. So uh, uh, on next one, please. And I think that's it. Thank you. Do you think that this is a magazine quality photograph? Oh, yeah. I'm very impressed by this. No
All right, so that was our chance to brag about how, what great observers we are. And now, here's uh, Paul permission to challenge us with a uh, deep sky object. Paul, would you like to speak from your chair? Uh, yes, I will. The challenge object that I have chosen for this month, it's called Einstein's Cross, it's in Pegasus. Now, the reason I chose this, uh, the uh, Astronomical League in the United States, which is quite similar to RASE here, this is their challenge object. The thing is, this is the only opportunity that amateurs have of seeing gravitational lensing. There's a lot of gravitational lensing. You see pictures of it, but all these, usually all the ones that you see in the photographs are 25th, uh, 30th magnitude, something that's out of the range of the average person that has a telescope, the, uh, an amateur. So I thought I'd choose this one. It's called CGCG, which stands for uh, Catalog of Galaxies and Clusters of Galaxies by Fritz Zwicky. That's the number, 37815. Uh, come and see me, I got the exact uh, coordinates for it. The, uh, actually, the, ma the uh, uh, galaxy is 15.1, but in order to see the four uh, parts, the cross, you have to expose, but you'll have to be very careful if you're looking for this. You, you need to, to observe it, you need at least a 20 inch telescope or more. The photograph, you can do this with a, a 12 or a 14 inch like I have, but you have to be very careful. Don't overexpose, you'll get a white blob. Underexpose, you won't see it. So you're going to have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I have, by the way, I myself haven't seen it yet, so I'm going to try for it. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Fortunately, it's not dark all the time. Every once in a while, the moon appears, so we have a lunar challenge as well, presented by uh, Mary. Ooh, okay. Do we have a pointer? Uh, pointer? Yes. pointer? That's not Brian McCullough. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> or, or this one. It's his evil twin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good have Okay, I selected uh, one uh, for tonight. It has nothing to do with Apollo 11. Uh, can I have the slide, please? Okay, um, what we're going to be looking at is uh, Mons Head, uh, Head Delta. It's in the Apennines uh, Mountains area. How to reach it, how I saw it on Monday, is uh, between Hibrium and Serenitatis. I came down from the north down to this area here. So it's an easy thing to find optically, and any scope you should be able to get it with even binoculars. Next slide. Okay, here it is. We come across a wonderful plateau, dark, very dark, draws you in all the way down. Headley is this area here. Headley Delta is this. It's to the south, and it has this little place called St. George. Little that little little dent, two two kilometers wide. So those folks with the large telescopes, you can try for this. Us folks with only the four inches, I just got this very blob molar tooth thing. So that's a good thing. You have all kinds of uh, objects to see in this area. The Headley uh, Rayma that comes along here. And if you really want and have a 200 foot or 2,000 foot uh, mirror, you might be able to see Apollo 15 right about there. So, <laughs> so if you want to do that. So those are the challenges. Mons Delta here. Mons, uh, sorry, Mons uh, Hadley here, Mon, uh, Hadley Delta here, and St. George's for those who can really get into that. So it's an easy object, scalable to your, 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 the equipment that you have and your talents. And I saw it again last night using my four inch nuke, and it was great. It reminded me of the northern fjord areas uh, when they're in winter because of the different uh, libidos between the bright, bright, and dark, dark rays. And remember, shadow is everything. So, gotta watch the shadows. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Oh. Had nothing to do with Paul Levin, honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next we have Steve McIntyre to uh, uh, give us a presentation as to what we can observe over the next month. 
There's the advance button there. Right here? The, uh, right, the arrow. And laser. Yeah, okay, got it. So of all of the uh, seasons for astronomy follows my favorite. The um, skies are dark uh, early enough to be convenient. Um, moderate temperatures day and night and mosquitoes, well, less annoying, so you say, than the, the spring and summer. And September is a great month. There's uh, lots of identifiable constellations, uh, planets of every major, of every classification to see, um, a, um, an embarrassment of riches for deep sky objects. And the moon made a, a, a spectacular entrance, disappears conveniently mid-month so we can see all those deep sky objects, and then reappears uh, at the end of the month. And then there's the Milky Way. So looking, uh, looking south about mid-month, 9.30, which is about astronomical sunset, the sky looks like this. Bootes in the, um, um, was rising in the east in the spring and is now setting in the west, uh, marked by the bright star magnitude minus 0.7 Arcturus. It's the brightest star in the sky, although it's uh, setting and so it won't appear that bright. Next to it is uh, Corona Borealis. I, I just mark it because I think it's cool. Uh, from a really dark site um, and a low horizon, you can actually see its counterpart from, uh, from Ontario, the, the uh, Corona Australis, south of Sagittarius, but it's pretty ideal conditions. Uh, east of that is Hercules, um, home to a bright globular cluster M13, and then Cygnus uh, lying along the Milky Way. Below that, we have Ophiuscus and uh, to almost directly south of Sagittarius. If you're looking at the, um, just the, the top right-hand corner of Sagittarius, you're basically looking in, into the center of our galaxy. Yeah. East of that, we have uh, Pisces, Aquarius, and Copernicus, home to, uh, or marking where uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter uh, lie. And then uh, rising in the west, not, or uh, rising in the east, we have uh, Pegasus and, and Andromeda, and they'll, they'll make a better appearance in a couple of months and be due south around that time. Of all of the things in the night sky to, to just go out and, and observe visually, I think the Milky Way is, is by far my favorite. And, and so if you, if you haven't done so, you should really plan an outing just to a dark site solely to look at the Milky Way. You've got to get at least 20 minutes drive outside of, uh, from any uh, major light source. And the further you go, the better the view. And you know, it'll be well worth the, uh, the trip. Obviously, you need a good horizon to the southwest to see Sagittarius. But uh, if you can also find a site with sort of a panoramic view and something to the northeast, that's also good. The essential observing equipment for observing the, the Milky Way is a lawn chair, because this is a, uh, uh, it's just a look at the sky thing. Optionally, uh, binoculars uh, are highly recommended, and no charts. I, I don't rec you know, this is a, not a techno geek outing. This is just go out and look at it, sit back, and then and just and enjoy the view. And certainly we saw some spectacular charts earlier. Um, so looking south, um, this is a slightly exaggerated view of what you might see uh, visually, um, although not too far off the mark from a really good dark site. So you basically start by finding the, uh, the, the bright stuff uh, low down in the south and then trace the, um, the bright lanes across the, the zenith and to the north and then start looking for the dark lanes and, and then pick out the sort of motley structure. And then you pick up the binoculars and you basically just walk your way up from the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the Milky Way and there's all sorts of fantastic objects that just sort of pop into view with binoculars. And then when you get home, you can break out the charts and, and uh, figure out what it is you were looking at. Uh, Jupiter is by far the brightest object, uh, save the moon in the night sky at magnitude uh, 2.7. It outshines everything. You won't have any trouble seeing it. It's, uh, it's uh, a little bit east of, uh, of south, about 26 degrees off the horizon. It's about one and a half hand widths uh, uh, high. Um, through binoculars, you can easily pick out the four moons, and if you hold them steady enough, you can even make out the disk with a 7x5 or 7x50 uh, set of binoculars. Um, next to it is Neptune at uh, magnitude 7.8. It's a challenging object to catch with binoculars, uh, but uh, well within reach. And it's um, a lot easier to catch right now um, 
because it, it's nicely framed by a set of, by a nice little rectangle, two on the east and three stars on the west, and there's a magnitude uh, eight point. Um, so charts advance a little fast there. It, it's a, sort of a little bit to the left uh, of the center, and by the end of the month, it's only moved about two minutes to the west, and uh, it's still going to be basically in the same field of view. That's what you'll. That's the field of view from a 10 by 50 set of binoculars, easily within reach. Uh, quite a bit further to the east, uh, we have Uranus rising. It's not a great uh, uh, object for September, but I'd include it just to sort of complete the uh, ensemble of planets. At magnitude 5.7 on a dark site, you can actually see that with the naked eye. But it's a fairly challenging object to see, uh, particularly in the glow of city lights, par par mostly because it's kind of all by itself right now. There's no sort of convenient markers. So kind of as you start by finding the, the head of Pisces, a very uh, obvious structure, although it itself, from, uh, if your sight's not uh, great, is a little hard to find. It's basically only made up of magnitude four and five stars, so it doesn't sort of pop out. And then find it south uh, from that, there's a nice little zigzag pattern also made up of four and five magnitude stars. And uh, you work your way up and then you find Uranus. Once you've found it, it'll be obvious. Uh, unfortunately, none of these markers sort of fit within the field of view of binoculars, so you kind of have to play hop, skip, and jump across. Um, this is not a bad picture of Saturn, but it's, the, uh, it's what's called the Saturn Nebula. It, it appears on many observing lists, and it's also on the RESC's uh, list of uh, finest NGC objects. It's also mentioned in this uh, current issue of Sky News. But I gotta tell you, I, f I think it's a rather challenging object, uh, even for larger scopes and, and very difficult for smaller scopes. Um, with my binoculars, uh, even my, just south of CARP, um, I, can, uh, I can find it. It just looks like a magnitude eight uh, dot. Um, with my seven inch Newtonian, I start to see the extended uh, shape and, and a bit of the elongated uh, uh, oval shape to it. Um, I, I just researching, I, I found various reports from 25 arc seconds to 1.7 uh, arc minutes. I think 25 arc seconds is, is more likely what the, uh, the extended disk would uh, look like. And various observing reports, uh, even with you know, 14 inch and 20 inch scopes, uh, found it difficult to find the 11.5 magnitude central star. It's basically overwhelmed by the nebula itself. And to see the actual knobs, uh, very few reports uh, actually mention seeing them. So visually, uh, it, uh, it's a challenging object to find, and I think well worth the effort. And from uh, here's a, a, one of the uh, pictures I, I pulled off the net from uh, uh, what advertises to be uh, an amateur observatory site in, uh, in Chile. So it's, uh, it's a rather spectacular picture. Um, one of my, my favorites is uh, the Blinking Nebula, NGC 6826. Um, lots of other things blink, but uh, this guy gets the name. It's possibly it's my favorite just because of the, the way I found it. Um, I was uh, really observing at a very dark site um, last year and working my way through somebody else's list of, of neat things to look at. And, I'd found several of them, and you know, then my next to the list was the Blinking Nebula, and I, okay, that sounds pretty cool. So pointed the scope at the Blinking Nebula, use, you know, cheating a bit using the go-to function, and looked at it, didn't see anything. And I thought, okay, so I, I made a mistake. So I, I looked away to see if I'd done the right thing, and all of a sudden a flash caught my eye. So I looked back at the scope, nothing. Look away, flash again. So it took me a couple of seconds to figure out what was happening. So, so basically, while well, looking at the central star through a, a modest scope, I was using an 8-inch SCT, you, you see the magnitude 10.5 star. And then with a verted image, the nebulous, uh, nebulosity just sort of pops into view. With a small scope, you're basically only going to see the 10.5 uh, central star. And with a larger scope, looking, looking uh, directly at it, you're going to see the nebulosity. So this is kind of the perfect object for mid-sized scope. And from a dark sky where the uh, nebulosity is going to stand out against the background, uh, to me, it's a, uh, it is a really cool object. Now, for my, uh, again, for my home in CARP, the um, you know, magnitude four and five stars, and even with my seven inch Newtonian, I could not get it to blink. So uh, my thinking is that you really need a, a dark sky to, uh, to see the nebulosity. Uh, just a few of the, the dates and highlights. Um, 
Jupiter put on a neat show a couple of days ago. If you missed it, this information is not helping you very much. But uh, basically, it appeared in the sky with no moons. All the moons were either be in front of it or behind it. Uh, but you, you can see it again. You just have to wait around to 2019, and uh, the show will start again. Uh, one of the things I did miss on the chart, uh, September 29th is your uh, a chance to see Jupiter uh, in daylight. Um, so just uh, a little bit before uh, sunset, um, Jupiter will be one degree south uh, west of, uh, of the moon. Uh, so that's a pretty good marker. And um, about six o'clock in the evening in the east, Jupiter and the moon will be about 10 degrees or maybe like a half a hand's width above the, uh, the sky and uh, shining at magnitude 2.7 if you have a... Uh, you know, if it's clear that night, you should be able to see Jupiter. Sunset's around 6.45. It's still pretty bright around 6.45. There you go. Thank you very much. Thanks. We're uh, a little ahead of schedule, so I'd like to invite uh, Mike Mark Magadan, assisted by Linda here, to talk about the fun we've been having in public outreach. Next slide, please. So a couple of Fridays ago, we were planning a... Um, a, uh, a star party at CARP, and I wanted to, uh, at the uh, CARP library, uh, Diefenbunker site, and we're really interested in testing out this site here because we hadn't been there for um, a couple of years, and, and I didn't know the site, so I was tossing around the idea in, uh, in a, um, in a, uh, amongst uh, a couple of members here about uh, maybe getting a small group out there just to see what it's like, see what the light conditions are like, and so forth. Well, this was after about six, six, seven weeks of you know endless clouds, and then when we're and this was on Wednesday, I, I looked ahead to Friday, and it was just like a stretch of clear skies. So we said, let's maybe open this up. So one thing led to another, and then um, it was uh, we made an announcement that let's just do it. Let's do it. Let's do a full a star party. Gary Boyle did really did his thing here with uh, radio promotions and 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 had a uh, interview on the, on the radio. And before you know it, um, uh, uh, you know, with a, you know, all of a sudden we had uh, over 200 people that uh, that showed up, and, and and lots of members with telescopes and so forth. Um, you know, lo lots of funny stories. Uh, I, I remember I, I was at the front uh, uh, entrance there, waving people in, introducing, you know, introducing people, welcoming them, um, you know, telling them to turn off their car lights, which they really can't do anymore, and it seems with fleet cars, uh, as, as they approach our site, our, our observing site. And uh, the mosquitoes were brutal, as they, they seemed to love me. And here I was going like this, you know, and, uh, and uh, Gary, Gary Boyle drove up and he said, Mike, you're waving people away. Why are you waving people away? <laughs> I truly, it was bad. But um, the mosquitoes, uh, they, 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 they left us after about a, a half hour, 45 minutes, and uh, what, what an evening that was. So I was pretty pumped about it. And, um, next slide. And what I thought I might do is just to, uh, share a couple of the uh, nice emails that came, that came my way. Here's one, I'll just give you a second to read it. Um, these are both people who are not members. The, f the first uh, one, the person is obviously referring to uh, Attila's um, uh, uh, daub there. And I got a real kick out of, I have to share with you Attila's response to this. Now, he's obviously referring to himself. So Attila is what I was telling you, but I was going to quote you. Uh, so his response to that, that uh, first um, uh, uh, comment there was, nothing more gratifying to a geek with a hobby on the margins of society than to hear strangers say they've been touched by the wonders revealed by that geeky hobby. So I got a kick out of that. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So um, some, uh, again, some more comments. Instead of bringing people up to talk about, you know, these are from, these are from our own members to talk about the event. It was a real, it was just tr um, really gratifying. One personal story that I had, um, for me, I had my telescope in my car. I was doing a lot of running around, and I really felt, you know, bad that I didn't have it. I didn't have time to set it up and so forth. But um, uh, as I was, uh, you know, I was getting some bottled water for for the members, you know, um, and I had my trunk opened up. Another car pulled up with a family, and I don't know how it started, but I um, I had a, a discussion with them about the night sky and and, uh, and various constellations. I had my laser pointer with me, and before I know it, I had these people with me for about a half hour talking about what to ex you know what to expect when they you know go look through the telescopes. And I told them, I said, folks, you know, I'm not, I feel bad. I'm keeping away from the main event, but they actually said, you know, I'm this is. This is why we're here. We're, we're really happy to hear this. So um, we did really well, and I think I think um, that's why. Um, next slide, please. That's why. Um, and oh, before I talk about the schedule going forward here, uh, here are the here are the uh, volunteers that we had uh, from our our site or, or from our center, and and the um, it was a terrific uh, terrific evening. I want to thank everyone. Um, 
and it was just, uh, it was about as good as it gets. And I'm really pumped and motivated to do this again, as you'll see. So next slide. So, um, uh, I uh, want to talk about the, the uh, upcoming schedule that I have. So I emailed the schedule out, and it will be posted on, the, uh, on, on, the, um, on our, our RAC website, on the Ottawa RAC website. Um, so I ha do have uh, two events coming up. Uh, the first event is a double header on Saturday, September the 12th, which, um, it, it, once again, all the, uh, first of all, all these events are at the uh, CARP Library, Diefenmucker site. So for those of you who are not familiar with the area, it's uh, the, on CARP Road, just a little bit uh, down or up or further north, I should say, from the uh, CARP Fair. And on the left-hand side of the road as you drive north um, is the Diefenbunker, CARP Library, Diefenbunker site, and, and, uh, or the, uh, Ottawa, the CARP branch of the Ottawa Public Library, I should say. Um, but on Saturday, September 12th, we have a double header. It's a daytime solar observing in the, in the afternoon, and uh, w obviously weather permitting, and, uh, and an evening star party. Lynn is going to talk about the uh, daytime um, uh, component in, in, a, in a moment here. Uh, I have a couple of rain dates, okay? So uh, if, it, um, if, it, uh, if it rains for the evening star party on the September the 12th, obviously we, we're, I have it uh, the following Friday. If it rains on the following Friday, well, um, we'll have it on Saturday, September the uh, uh, 19th, the following, the following day. So, the, so rain dates as, as, as backup. We, I do not have a backup event for the daytime solar observing, uh, but just for the evening star parties. So after we do that, okay, so obviously we'll have one uh, uh, evening star party. Um, so the first uh, clear night that we hit and we have the star party, we won't have the subsequent rain date. We won't uh, attend the subsequent rain dates, obviously. Uh, I've got another series of uh, e uh, evening star parties. So this first one is scheduled for Friday, October 9th. If it's uh, clear that night, great, we're, we're, we're done, and who knows, maybe I might schedule some more. But um, um, in the event of rain on the October the 9th, we have backup dates on October the 10th and, and, uh, and October the 16th. The important thing is for those people who, um, who are, aren't familiar with what star parties we hold is, is you really need to check the website uh, because clouds tend to roll in at the last minute here. So uh, it's really important that you check that. I think that's all I had. Linda, do you want to? So just don't move ahead just yet. <laughs> um, I just have to point out that actually the daytime solar observing is, is from 11 to 4. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't okay. touch that mic. Okay. okay, so you can go ahead, Tim. So this is the, as we come, Rolf and I did a video, as you're coming up to the site, there's the Diefenbunker in the library sign. And we've passed the market. The carp market is on that day, also from eight to one. So you're driving down in the into the uh, parking lot area, and uh, you see the view. So there it is in front of you. And to the left is the parking, and the telescope parking. I'll show you in another slide uh, afterward. And uh, so it goes over there to the left. The, the telescopes and the people who will park there and ahead of you is the library there and then the Diefenbunker is there and that's the, the entrance to the Diefenbunker site that Rob Alexander had arranged a tour for just recently. Okay, the next slide, Tim. And the library, as, I, as you can read there, is, is uh, the, the friends of the library have a bookstore in there and this attracts people to the library, obviously. And this section, uh, Carp Book Corner, is the bookstore. And we sell all kinds of titles in there, and they like to have events to promote this. So I came up with this because it was IYA, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to be there and for the library to attract people and for the bookstore to sell books. They get these books from donations, and they sell them for two bucks. And there's a, there's a spinner on there as well that, of paperbacks. So everything is like gently used or practically new, basically, for $2, and that includes the hard, hardcovers. So it's a very good venue and the library has made a display table of their own and then we have our own display of astronomy books and promoting astronomy for this month and uh, the next slide and this is the parking where you would you can see where you would be bringing your telescopes to park there and the the uh, oh I, can you go back for a sec uh, Tim if you don't mind going through that fire door the is a reading garden and the, the, t the solar telescopes will be set up there. And so people will come into the library and they'll just go through that door to, the, to see the solar viewing. And that's it. Thank you. Hope you all come. So, sort of
register in advance? No, you can just show up. So it's sort of like at a casino, you have to walk past the slot machines. Yeah. <laughs> to see the really good stuff. It's actually on. Um, last February, I had a chance to go down to the Winter Star Party, which is uh, my favorite star party. Uh, let me think now. S observing in shorts in the winter. It's uh, hard to beat. Uh, by the way, when you see a name at the bottom of a slide, uh, that's who took the picture. <laughs> so Attila took this one. Uh, the route to uh, the Florida Keys is uh, right down here, and it takes 29 hours to drive. And uh, it's about 2,800 kilometers. You better travel with somebody you like and, <laughs> and who's driving you trust. <laughs> uh, when we're heading down, the big deal is always seeing the Florida sign. So we all, there's a welcome center there with free, free orange juice. And we almost always stop and bask in the sunshine and the palm trees. Uh, the Florida Keys are a bunch of little islands that stretch 100 miles or so from Miami uh, west and south a bit, and uh, they're all connected by these bridges and causeways. Again, uh, this picture was Paul Shepard, who is in the audience, by the way, making sure I don't say anything nasty about him. Uh, again, another causeway. Um, there's only one road leading to uh, Key West, uh, actually, which is the end of the, all this, and so um, you can't get lost if you don't want to swim, and it but the problem is, every single person who goes there is on the same road, so it's pretty busy. Uh, this is an aerial site, and we are 35 miles about from Key West. Uh, the entranceway is uh, somewhere around here, and I was set up right there. Um, I don't have a really great southern horizon, but I'd image. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in imaging than observing. And so uh, not having seen flat to the horizon is not as important to me. And I was hoping to stay out of the wind. Uh, Paul Shepard and his wife, uh, came, they came down separately, but they met us there. And uh, they decided to uh, stay off site. So they're in a little campground. And the star party is at the other end of the bridge over here. Uh, they're on a different island. Uh, now, it turned out that uh, it was a little inconvenient to get in and out of the star party because there's a big policeman at the door. And the other thing is you can't drive into it at night, obviously. So you have to park on the, that very busy highway and walk in. So it makes it sometimes a little bit exciting. Uh, this is Paul, uh, me, and my wife, Ginny, who is also in the audience. Uh, one, I was going to have, I had all kinds of jokes about Ginny, and at the last minute she decided to come tonight. So, <laughs> they've all been removed. Now, my talk is much shorter now. Uh, we call that the, the banana cabana. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's what, we, what I use for observing. Uh, Ginny uses it for camping, but I use it for observing. Uh, at the back, back in here, there are two great big, car, uh, big old RV batteries. And uh, I, can, I actually power myself. Uh, from inverters off of that, off of those batteries. So I can, I'm independent of the power grid, though I use the power grid to charge up my batteries. Uh, this is the telescope that I took down. It was a Peter Servolo's 11-inch uh, uh, astrograph, and it's a fantastic telescope. And I was planning on doing a lot of imaging with it. Unfortunately, it's like really big, and <laughs> it didn't get windy one night. It got windy for two weeks. The wind just howled. Everybody was complaining. All the, the, the local people were complaining about how this wind was awful. Uh, it was kind of a balmy wind. I mean, it wasn't like uncomfortable, but it just meant that the scope was blowing around all the time. And this is <laughs> the kind of images I got with this thing. Uh, now, you can stack as many of those as you want. <laughs> it doesn't turn out really great. That's right. Anyway, uh, so what I did was I switched to a short focal length scope, and this is uh, my imaging scope right here. It's a 76 millimeter uh, Teleview uh, scope. It, it's a fa fabulous little uh, uh, scope for strong, uh, astrophotography. The problem was is that it had been bouncing around in the car all the way down, and so it was slightly out of collimation when I got to it. Not the scope itself, but all the stuff I stuck on it was slightly not aligned right. So. I, never, I was there for five days or six days, and no, longer this time, eight, seven days. I had a fabulous time. I didn't end up with a whole lot of great images, though, but it was warm. 
Um, as I mentioned, we're powered. <laughs> you know, but power is really important to us. And so me and every other astrophotographer in the place plugged into the same plug. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was really good. This is a good story about this one here. Last year, until it reminded me, this pole caught on fire. <laughs> And this year, the, G, the GFI, uh, which is like to prevent you from being electrocuted, kept on malfunctioning. So they solved that problem by removing the GFI. <laughs> so, uh, right. So we didn't uh, we didn't lose our power, but uh, you know, three guys were electrocuted. Um, just some of the scopes in the area. It was just you know this beautiful sand berm that we're on, uh, white coral sand, just absolutely gorgeous palm trees observing in the middle of the night with a nice 80 degree wind blowing on you. It's fabulous. This is your southern horizon. Hard to beat. You know, just fabulous. That goes, that's Cuba there in the distance. 80 miles. Another scope, I have absolutely no idea what that thing is. Oh, is that what it is? That's, that's going to call the garbage can. <laughs> Yeah. It was, it was beautifully machined. It really, yeah. It's a great, gorgeous scope. Uh, this is the guy who sat up next to me. His name is Chris. Uh, he worked for some big oil company, so he spent a lot of time telling me why you can't recycle car tires. Uh, but he brought in a, a, um, a Paramount telescope mount, and he put on it a 14-inch Celestron. You know, so it's really great. The Paramount, by the way, doesn't come apart. Uh, so this thing here weighs like 150 pounds. <laughs> So the poor guy was staggering from his car, which is about 100 meters away, to the site. And uh, he set it up, and I thought to myself, this is fantastic, because I'm sitting up beside him. I, I'll image, and I'll look through his telescope when he finds objects. So he's doing the Herschel 400. Well, the Herschel 400 is 400 of the crappiest things you've ever seen in your life. Uh, they're little tiny, like, clusters that are, like, look like stars in a 14-inch telescope. I mean, it was incredible. So every time he found one, he'd call me over, and I'd look in it. He'd then have to describe to me where it was. <laughs> and uh, so it was uh, kind of interesting, but not very beautiful. I thought this was kind of interesting. Here you've got an $800 telescope on top of a $12,000 mount. <laughs> I'm sure it was rock steady, though. <laughs> this is called the bat scope. <laughs> that really does look like that big searchlight eh, that brings Batman. I like the stick. I like the stick through it. Is that to keep it from blowing around? I guess. Not roost. Yeah, that's could be. Uh, one of the things I liked the most was getting together with a bunch of astronomer, astrophotographers. And here you're looking at three really great guys, um, and they, uh, uh, you know, we're just sitting around looking in a telescope or looking at a screen or seeing what their setups are. And so uh, for five or six days, you know, you spend a lot of time with these guys. They're set up, they're set up right in our area. There's about six or 700 people at this uh, star party. And so you get to hang around with the 15 or so that are in your area. And so uh, by accident, the last three or four years, we've all set up in the same area. And uh, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, yeah, Brian Lula, yeah. Uh, this is um, uh, the vendor area, which is really quite excellent. Everybody here has more, everybody at this party has more money than I have. Uh, so you can, you can see like the $12,000 mount is kind of a low-end mount for these guys. Uh, anyway, so the, the vendors are really happy to be here. Uh, and so the, this is a row of vendors, and it actually goes around the corner a little bit over to here. So there's a, there's a ton of vendors. That happens to be Brian there, actually, by accident, Attila got him in the photograph. There's 700 people at the star party, and Attila gets the same guy twice. And this is looking back at what we call the berm. And so along here, this has all got a southern exposure. Uh, it's fabulous low, you know, ocean horizon. A fantastic place to observe. The wind was blowing, so it was uh, hard to keep your scope steady, especially the big daubs. And you can see there's a lot of them all set up in one area. Again, that southern horizon. I love the no swimming sign. You should see the beach. Well, you saw the beach, right? Where did I just miss it here? No, yeah, there's the beach. Just makes you want to go swimming, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the no swimming sign. It should be like no lunatics. <laughs> uh, the trouble with the star, winter star party, my only complaint about it, the only thing I don't like is, is it's too many people and too small an area. Uh, this is kind of an exaggerated view, 
but still, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty crowded sometimes. Uh, Jenny and I took a, uh, uh, a side trip down to Key West and stood beside this uh, Key West, you know, most southerly uh, spot. And uh, it was uh, me. We had to fight off like 700 Japanese tourists to do this, get this picture. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. This guy here is the, the guide to the, li the, the little White House, which is in Key West. Uh, um, uh, Harry Truman used to go down there. And this guy here, it could be like Paul Commission's grandfather. Uh, he's the <laughs> oldest freaking guy I've ever had give me a tour. <laughs> And uh, the uh, streets are just incredible. I mean, just talk about tropical paradise. Uh, we saw a shack for sale for $700,000. And the uh, southern view. Uh, people gather on the wharf to watch the sunset here in Key West. Just a fantastic view. And the places, there's, there's a couple of areas where there's little key deer. And you can see the thing, it's about the size of a, like a Labrador dog, mm -hmm. little tiny thing, and if you run over one of those things, like it's a 30-year jail sentence. <laughs> uh, the speed limit is, uh, is like uh, 40, 40 miles an hour in any area where they are. Uh, the police are crawling all over the place, so you have to be extremely careful. There's like just a few hundred of them, I believe. And just around the corner from the Star Party, we went to a little nature reserve, and found this iguana in a tree. Now, iguanas are not native to, to Florida, but they're an introduced species, and they're breeding there now, so I guess they're, they're, they're there. And just underneath this iguana was an alligator. <laughs> I never heard of alligators at the Star Party site, but it makes you think. This wasn't very far away. And fantastic climate. You know, in February, you're looking in. The flowers just never cease to amaze me. And here's Ginny and I at the raffle, uh, the draw prizes at the end of the star party, where they have ten thousands, th tens of thousands of dollars of prizes. Um, uh, lots of lots of guys are donating very expensive stuff, and uh, we again won nothing. Uh, <laughs> but Paul Shepard won a CCD camera. I mean, that was one of the crummier prizes. And um, we, uh, Jenny wanted to make a little detour before, instead of coming straight home. She wanted to come, uh, she wanted to go on a little detour. And um, uh, I convinced Paul Shepard to take my trailer home. It was fantastic. But he was, I think he was afraid he was going to crash. And so when, it, when, he got, when he got home, he sent me a picture that he had arrived home safely to make sure that if something was wrong with my trailer, it was somebody else's fault. <laughs> and here are some images taken at the star party. Again, this is Attila Danko. This is Comet Lewin, which was really fabulously positioned in the sky. And here's a picture of the Milky Way, again by Attila. You know, Attila always claims he's not an astrophotographer, mm. but like he's been lying to us. I think he's a, like a, a closet, a closet astrophotographer. This is the skies that you have there. The skies are not actually all that dark. Um, there's there's uh, some towns nearby, and there's a highway not very far away. But it just, uh, just seems to be neater. This is uh, Orion. You can see the three belt stars and the Orion Nebula. And again, uh, the three belt stars uh, here, here, and here. And there's the flame nebula, and there's the horse head showing up in there, a little bit of the red nebula behind, and again, the Orion nebula, and a satellite. Mm -hmm. You could figure out how, you know, if, uh, uh, Mr. Earl could figure out how long this exposure was by how far that track was. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I have no idea what it is. What is that, Attila? Is that the Pleiades? Yeah, that's the Pleiades. Oh, wow, fantastic. There's Paul Shepard and his scope. Picture of the moon. He ex exposed it long enough to get the Earth shine, which is sort of interesting. Because you can see that it was a sliver of a moon uh, late, in the e late in the evening. Early in the evening, right? Wrong. Uh, again, the Orion. Uh, Orion, there's the three belt stars and the Orion Nebula right here. Uh, this is the moon and Venus together.
This is John Talbot. John Talbot was set up next to me. John Talbot is a hurricane hunter. You know, he's, he gets in those airplanes down in Mississippi and flies into hurricanes. That's his job. And uh, so he, everybody, uh, you know, normally everybody bugs at Tillo about the weather. But this guy here, uh, people would come to him and say, you know, what's the weather? So he'd look, he had some kind of secret satellite site that he was able to look at. And he'd tell us if there's clouds coming or not. Anyway, he's a pretty good ast astronomer, astrophotographer. And this is his uh, picture that won the contest, actually, down there. Interesting how the double ta the tails at each end showed up. And again, uh, Comet Lewin. Love the color. This is Dean uh, Schwarzenberg. He was also set up nearby. And uh, Dean has this wonderful tack that he mounts on a G11 mount, which isn't really, I don't think, heavy enough for this mount, for this scope. But he does a fabulous job with it. And he was kind of protected by his trailer. And he got some pretty good sizes, M51. How do you get their pictures? Hmm? How do you get their pictures? Uh, I, off the net. Yeah, they posted them all, and I got them. Uh, Dean's uh, 82, M82. Some NGC when I forget what it is. <laughs> Looks great, eh? I love that. It's my favorite one, actually. NGCXXX. Yeah. Merkin chain, maybe? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. It's actually a little happy face. Mm hmm. Another NGC. I should know what that one is, but I can't remember. 3628. Okay. Great. Uh, look at the, uh, the veining that he gets in the, in the center. That's, that's, you know, pretty good detail there. This is Rick Schrantz. Rick is a really interesting guy. He's, uh, he, he's, he, he doesn't talk much. So uh, I think he's a, some kind of computer guy, and I don't think he knows how to talk. Uh, <laughs> he, ha he, has a, he has a homemade 12-inch telescope that's F10. It's like 10 feet long, and it's in a great big sewer pipe. And uh, he mounts it on this astrophysics mount, and he does... He does um, Planetary work, fa pl fabulous pa planetary photography with it. Yeah, like in a hurricane, that's going to work real well. Anyway, he took this one here. Uh, this is an H-alpha image. And this was the best planetary image we had down there, again by Rick. And you can see it's pretty ordinary. Uh, but in a gale, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. The one he had last year looked like it came out of a magazine. And these are a few of mine. Again, you, if you look at the, closely at the stars, you see the slightly miscalumated scope. M12. Now, this is, uh, this is the one image that I, this is like three days of imaging to, uh, with that uh, Cervola longer focus scope. And look here, I, this is the best images I got. I still have like screwball stars. No, that's that's wind aberration. Yeah, his scope is. Yeah. This is M83. Southern pinwheel, I think it's called. These are all now with the television, so these are pretty wide angle. Thor's helmet. And this is Venus with a you know, not a very long focal length scope. But uh, you can see that it's definitely showing phase. And then at the same time, I just switched over, there's the moon, showing the phase of the moon. There. And notice the angle of the moon, you know, like not here where you're standing at the end. And here's what they look like, uh, right up there. So it's, it's sort of eerie to see a moon lying on its back. Mm -hmm. And that's due to the being around the curve of the Earth a little bit further. And here's my Comet Lewin. Nice color, and you can see the stars are almost round. <laughs> now, I mentioned to you that I had my wife with me. She wanted to make a little detour. <laughs> can you see why I didn't want my trailer behind my car? So, uh, yeah, we, we, we saw a good chunk of the United States that, year, that's that winter. And uh, we, we saw a couple of astronomical things along the way, which I thought I'd include. Uh, first of all, we went to Roswell. Now, I was, uh, you know, I was skeptical about Roswell. You know, I'm not a total big believer in UFOs, but 
the sign, you know, clearly it's a research center. So it's, I'm sure it's legit. And like, like here's an actual model of an alien. <laughs> And here's Ginny and an alien. Like, what, else, what do you want? <laughs> she sure looks better than that alien, doesn't she? <laughs> All right, then I understand it's now called the Meteor Crater. Is that what it's called now? <laughs> anyway, Behringer uh, Crater in Arizona. This is, uh, uh, this is five or six images. It's a it's pretty wide angle. And it's really neat. They charge, I think, like 20 bucks to get in. It's, so you feel like it's a ripoff, but it's, it's really so surprising. And I don't know, 50,000 years ago, this thing crashed into the Earth. And it, it looks exactly like you'd imagine a crater to look. Uh, down here, they were uh, mining for the, for, the crater, for the meteor that hit. Uh, they thought they'd find a nickel and whatever it would be in a, cra in a, in a meteor. Uh, except it kind of, I think it got vaporized when it landed, so there's nothing there. Uh, but they dug a bunch of wells, and then some other, some, some airplane guy was circling around the edge of it here, and he just got below the edge, edge, edge of the uh, crater, and now because your plane's tilted, you know, for you're flying in a circle, you can't go up very well in these crummy little planes. And he circled around, circled around, circled around, and landed or crashed in the crater. So there's an airplane in the bottom of the crater. And, you know, it's pretty steep, showing the, the edge of the crater. And they have, a, they have a, a, an Apollo test capsule there. I, you know, they claim it's like could have flown. I'm suspicious it's just a mock-up. The boilerplate's really Yeah. <laughs> they would use that for, for parachute drop, drop tests. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Model yeah. Anyway, it was kind of neat to see how big it was. And you sure wouldn't want to have been in it for very long. And uh, we're going back, for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Piece of cake. OK. Ron, where are you? Ron St. Martin over there. This presentation is dedicated to you. <laughs> You're welcome. Here we go. OK. Um, on my trip across Canada last uh, summer, um, I do uh, what most people do in airplanes is spot the crater. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, the uh, St. Martin crater in Manitoba. And uh, right now, let's see, uh, whoops, there we go, oh, separate one. Yeah, so uh, it is kind of uh, an invisible crater, but uh, it's kind of exciting. There we go. Now, um, we had this mixed up, that's why I'm getting a Getting my, my, my bearings here. Okay, where'd my airplane go? Whoops. Did it work? How come it's not working? What are you looking for? There should be something coming across there. Maybe it won't work. Anyway, I, I, uh, I introduced my talks about uh, my craters. Uh, with this picture, I usually say that I flew to Puerto Rico to investigate a crater, only to find that somebody built a radio telescope in it. And uh, yeah, it, was pretty, it was a good trip. So anyway, um, St. Martin, it is in, right there, in Manitoba. It is uh, about 40 kilometers across. And to take a look at the relative sizes of it, St. Martin there. And the, if you see that circle in Quebec, uh, the Manicouagan crater, it's uh, pretty similar in size to that. It's the same size as Charlevoix that Ron and I uh, trekked through, and it's a little bit bigger than the Clearwater uh, uh, lakes, and they're some of the biggest craters on the planet. Um, it's very comparable. So getting closer, Lake Winnipeg, Lake Manitoba, and just over here, Dauphin Lake, just to uh, get your bearings correctly here. W w the way they actually discovered that this is a crater is um, in the middle of the uh, crater's little town called Gypsum. And they had a gypsum mine there. And scientists thought, well, it's a little bit uh, kind of uh, interesting, the uh, minerals coming out of this. They analyzed it and they found what's called planar deformation features. 
And this is a feature in quartz or, or feldspar that if you look at the linear, linear, whoops, wrong button here, here we go. The linear striations inside these, these this is about uh, less than a millimeter across. And this kind of effect is only occurs during a, a large impact of a, a bolide hitting the planet at uh, 12 plus kilometers per second or a nuclear explosion. Well, we dated this structure at over uh, uh, around 219 million years, so we pretty well eliminated a nuclear explosion. So we... Uh, you checked the UFO museum. Uh, oh, yeah, there's that, uh, Bob. We have to check that out. It's a research center. Yeah, oh, yeah of course. <laughs> that makes it real. <clears throat> so, as I uh, mentioned, about 219 million years ago, right in this area. Now, there's a lot of interesting geological effects happening here. It was right after the major extinction at 250 million years, where about 90, over 90 percent of the uh, life on this planet was eliminated. The uh, Siberian Traps is the uh, main culprit for that uh, extinction right now, but it's still up in the air. But uh, just keep in mind, I'm going to get into it a little bit later, there is a lot of things happen between these two uh, extinction areas here. Um, just to give you an example, uh, uh, large reptiles and dinosaurs, uh, their, their species had split and, uh, and of course the dinosaurs after this extinction right here, they started to uh, be the dominant life on this planet. Uh, there's no m mammals for another 50 million years, there's no flowers and there's no hardware, hard uh, wood uh, forests. To give you a, 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 an idea of what's going on on this planet when this happened. So, as I mentioned, uh, most people when they fly across the country, we play spot the crater, don't we? And uh, this picture I took, uh, the St. Martin crater is right about here. Um, I showed you on the map Lake Dauphin, just to give you some perspective. The Saskatchewan border is right over there. So uh, I was pretty excited to find out that we're right over this meteorite crater. Of course, everybody in the airplane uh, shared my excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I dodged a few uh, uh, magazines coming at me, but anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, actually between this crater and where we landed in Ottawa, there were nine meteorite craters. And of course, I pointed them out to everybody. And uh, I think we're all happy to land in Ottawa. In one piece. Uh, actually, I was still in one piece, so uh, and nobody bought me a drink. So, Anyway, in, uh, in my airplane, I got a little bit closer to it, and this here is uh, uh, ground zero on the uh, uh, St. Martin crater. And essentially, you can see there's no surf surface expression of this crater. So, hmm, why does Chuck say this is a very exciting place to be? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the crater is buried. Uh, it's under uh, over 100 meters of uh, glacial drift, of course, from the last ice ages, and uh, Jurassic uh, sediment. Now, when the, when the uh, bolide happened, uh, there was a lot of geology happening at the same time, and the crater was almost immediately buried by the sediments from the Jurassic period. So what we've got underneath this 100 meters is one of the most pristine craters on this planet. Uh, compared, compared to anything on the moon because it's been buried and uh, the, uh, uh, the geology of the crater itself hasn't been touched since the impact. So, um, inside there, there's a very well, uh, very definite uh, central peak, well-defined uh, with an annular trough, the annular trough right after the central peak. Now, if you remember that uh, picture of the Manicouagan crater I showed you with the uh, circle, well, that's the same as the, uh, the trough here. And, of course, we had a very good uh, defined um, uh, crater rim uh, as well. Drilling through here uh, was very, very uh, uh, fruitful for research and so on for uh, the breach and of course the planar deformation features which did define what the crater was. But uh, unfortunately, well unfortunately for the people in gypsum, the, uh, the, the groundwater itself was uh, contaminated by um, uh, fluorides and, and so on, and uh, the water uh, itself uh, was was full of calcium sulfate, uh, aka gypsum, and uh, that's why the town was named after that, I suppose. But there was a gypsum mine there for uh, for a long period of time, right at uh, ground zero on the central peak. 
But that's not all that's happening on that crater. Dr. Spray, he's another uh, guy that's kind of interested in craters like me. He's actually a PhD in it. And uh, he has a very interesting hypothesis. Now, I showed you the, uh, the, the, the time span this happened at. Well, within that time span, uh, the Red Wing in, in um, Minnesota, uh, of course, St. Martin, Manicouagan, one over here in, uh, in, in France that I can't pronounce for the life of me, and uh, the one in the Ukraine here, Obolan. They all happen at the uh, same relative time. Now, the dating methods that we have here are plus or minus a couple of million years because of the radioactive decays and the contaminations and so on. So every one of these craters are within the error uh, spikes of, uh, of these dating methods. So the, the hypothesis here is, is that at this time, there was what's called a, uh, a meteor or a meteorite shower, large impact uh, that created this crater chain. And looking at the uh, geology of the planet from, what, 219 million years ago, this is the, uh, the situation where the, plant, uh, the, the continents were. And a little bit uh, uh, better. It's almost totally in line here. So the hypothesis hasn't been uh, proven or disproven, uh, but it's an interesting hypothesis to say that, uh, hey, th this may have been a, uh, a large... Uh, heavy bombardment at 219 million years ago. One of the craters, uh, there's St. Martin there, uh, Manicouagan. This is the one that uh, I mentioned with the large circle. So the, the size of the St. Martin crater is almost the same as, as uh, the same size. And uh, just as an uh, aside here, Eric and I, Eric, uh, the guy on the camera, we explored this uh, crater into uh, Memory Bay here. It's very fascinating geology. And we were actually marooned on that island for uh, a little while. Um, if you look at the, the, the way the circle is here, well, the wind, when we took off, we, were, we had our campsite right in here. And we took off one morning to get across to where the car was. And um, it started off pretty calm that morning, didn't it? Yeah, it was nice. But the wind, and coming from the west, we were in the lee here, veered around to the north, coming straight down this, this pipe. And uh, the wind, uh, the, basically the waves are almost six or seven feet high. So here we were, two guys, we're not light guys, a canoe full of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Eric very wisely said, Chuck, I think we better bail out. So we did, uh, we spent most of the day, uh, actually almost 24 hours on that island. So we, we looked at our food and we thought, well, we have five days, I think we could survive. But fortunately, the wind did die enough to, to us to get across. Interesting adventure. Anyway, more adventures in Craterland for Chuck. So anyway, this is the... Uh, that on another occasion. Well, actually, yes, we should. We should. We have, we have excellent videos on that. Uh, this is the continents today, and of course, uh, the craters are not in line anymore, but as we said, that the, uh, the dates of these craters are um, pretty, pretty close to say that this is a possibility. So research is ongoing for this. So... The uh, final point I'm going to make, um, there's, a, there's a large crater that was discovered in Chesapeake, the same kind of thing as St. Martin's. It's buried, it's under a lot of uh, glacial drift and so on, and the way they discovered it was from drilling and finding planar deformation features and breaches and so on. But uh, what I want to show you about uh, the Chesapeake crater, it uh, is almost the same as the St. Martin. If we look at See the circles I just drew there? The uh, York and James Rivers, right on the crater rim. And the hypothesis is, and this has been published, that look at the, the 90 degree diversion of this river and the same of the York up here, right on the crater rim. And the, uh, the scientific uh, theory on this is that the, um, the breccia inside the crater had slumped enough that there was a differential in the, uh, in the um, uh, density of the various uh, land um, densities. So th they caused these di great, great diversions. Well, this is a uh, published uh, theory about the Chesapeake. And there's a similar thing in the St. Martin that nobody has uh, published or talked about. If you look at the Dauphin River here, it has the same effect. Now, if you look at 
you know, a meander, that's a typical meander of a river. It's almost a sine wave. And, but this is not a meander. This is a definite diversion. So if you look at the fact that the, the, the river has diverged right on the, the crater rim, very similar to the Chesapeake. Here, you look at the, uh, the James New York rivers here. Which way does that river flow? North? It goes from the St. Martin uh, Lake into Lake Win <laughs> Winnipeg that's over here. The, the, of course, the, the train around this area is very, very flat, so it can the floods. And uh, the drainage is from south to north. Of course, uh, it, it thaws the last up here, so the water comes up and finds the ice, so of course it backs up and floods everybody. So this is the, uh, this is the reason for the floods there. But to my knowledge, there has not been any, any uh, explanation for this large diversion. So Chuck and uh, his, his uh, infinite wisdom here thought, well, this, I'll call this Chuck's hypothesis. And uh, I've published it on the website, and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But anyway, this is a, uh, a picture of the diversion. This is at the north uh, east part of the crater itself. And uh, it's not a meander. Uh, it's, a, it's a deliberate diversion of the river direction. Yeah, it's a, it's a, and, and you would think, you, you usually find this in a mountain or something, that, uh, you know, with, between mountains and so on, the uh, various geolog geological faults cause the river to change directions very uh, drastically. But the, uh, the land here is extremely flat, so uh, who knows? And, uh, of course, uh, the Dauphin River goes further out following the rim. is the rim of the crater here. And follows the, the, the uh, river right out to the Lake Winnipeg out here. So, on that note, uh, that's it. And thank you for your attention. Sure. Any, uh, any, any question? Anybody with crater, crater spotting? Um, the five craters that you showed up on the earlier yeah. um, uh, latitude map, yeah. is there any e evidence, I mean, aside from the positioning and the approximate times, is there e e any e evidence of similar composition that they might have come from a, one larger broken up body or anything yeah. like that? That, that's a good. That's a that's a good question. The question is, is that uh, is there any uh, composition of the bolide itself that is an indicator of what kind of meteorite hit there? And um, the answer is no, not yet. Um, there hasn't been any confirmation of that. That's why we're still in a nebulous uh, theory about this. The only uh, um, I, I say uh, confirmation of his hypothesis is the fact that it's in in line and they're all on the same date. So uh, aside from that, we really don't uh, have anything else. As we uh, get, a, get into more and more research, the, of course, the, the one in the Ukraine hasn't been uh, studied at all, to my knowledge, or, or very much. This one here is extremely eroded. Uh, uh, this one here, uh, West Wing, is uh, buried. It's similar to St. Martin. It's very, very buried. And uh, the Manicouagan, any, any um, uh, sign of the bolide itself has been washed away. Um, over the crater itself, you're looking at maybe about two kilometers of erosion. So uh, the only, only way you'd find that is the impact melt itself. Uh, you may find some kind of uh, indicator that the bolide has influenced the, uh, the melt. Uh, it happened in Brent, but not uh, to these craters to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, there's one. Yeah, yeah, so what, I guess the question is then, what influenced that sedimentary dome? And, um, whoops, where I'm going, going the wrong way. Well, with the sedimentary dome, it's just uplift. You know, you have a big piece of trucian, but here you've had an impact, so you've got a similar thing where you're over a crater rim. Yeah. You will be acting, you know, the same way as sort of some uplift mm -hmm. sedimentary craters. Yeah, uh, I'd like more opinions from an geologist, but uh, we definitely have a, a, de a change in density of the bedrock underneath it. Uh, there's a lot of breccia here, of course, with the gypsum and so on, the mine. Then there's nothing like uh, of any breccia type of deposits outside. So there is a density difference, and the hypothesis is, is that these rivers were changed because of that difference. 
So uh, yeah, that dome effect is a uh, is a uh, effect, and uh, of course we had that central peak is right in the middle. Where are we here? Right there. So you're looking at the uh, the diversion of the river right on the crater rim. So uh, within this, of course, it's uh, you got the slumping and so on, but the uh, the glacial fill would make it all level, but uh, the erosion rate or so on would be different. That's my amateur answer to that. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's one in the back there. Yeah, uh, you, you were, yeah, exactly. It's not exactly in line, uh, precisely. Um, some of the crater chains we saw on one of the moons on Jupiter, I think, uh, I can't remember exactly, but there's one that the, the chains are right in line. And uh, this is not totally in line. That's, uh, that's the opposite argument to the crater chain uh, hypothesis. So, yeah. Yeah, the Sh shoemaker Levy, of course, uh, was bang, 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 bang. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So last month, uh, I set up a lunar challenge. Uh, I brought in a, a, a photograph of somebody who had taken a, a slab of modeling clay up to the eyepiece of his telescope, and as he was observing, he modeled uh, the crater Archimedes, Autolycus, and Aristillus. And, uh, and then he took it, once he had this thing modeled right at the eyepiece, he would add clay to it and build it all up with a beautiful image. Then he took it indoors and uh, took some, uh, some chalks and put in some light colored chalks, some dark colored chalks, just to put the albedo features uh, of the lunar surface on there. So that inspired me uh, to put out a challenge to people to come up, not with a multimedia event, this is this computer talk again, but it's, a, it's more of a mixed media. Uh, idea of the representation of the moon. Now, did anybody did anybody respond to that bait? Fortunately, <laughs> I have brought something. So this is going to be a different way, and I'm going to do it right here. We're going to get the camera set up, put the light on. I'm going to construct uh, an image of the moon right now. What I've got right here is a picture of. Uh, this is from the Sky News with Jupiter on the cover. Page 14 is a picture of the full moon. I'll use this as my guide. I could do it in my sleep, but you would be annoyed by the snoring. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an image? Oh, look at this. If anybody had brought some kind of mixed media <coughs> representation of the moon, what I brought here is... It's a sketch of the crater uh, Gassendi that I did for the Journal of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society a while back. That's what I've done, I put one in as a door prize. Thank you, Bob, for taking it. it made me feel really good. Right. I brought a few extra copies. If there had been people who had brought, uh, brought a, something in to show us, they would have had one of these, and I brought a couple extra if anybody wants to buy one for a modest $5. All right. Anyway, so there we go. So what we're going to do, uh, I swept this from my father's place. This is a uh, plate from... Uh, the inside of a microwave oven. Everything's clean, everything's just been cleaned here. We're gonna go a step at a time here, so no. Step number one. Put the gloves on. And why, you ask? My doctor usually does that. <laughs> I'll determine that for myself. <laughs> All right. Don't bend over there. Over right <laughs> okay, here we go. Now cough, Mr. McCullough. <laughs> now the doctor always said, turn your head and cough. So I finally asked the doctor one time, why do you have to turn your head? Does that kind of stretch something? Or he goes, no, so you don't cough in my face. <laughs> you live, you learn. All right, so I got my picture of, can I pull that down? Can you still hear me all right? All right. So I can see the picture here. I've got the glass plate. I've put a couple of sheets of paper down just to keep everything neat and tidy. The materials I'm going to be working with are... Can you see that? Mini marshmallows. These are white mini marshmallows. In fact, this might slide around a bit too much. Done. I'll work right here. So I've got... You've even got mascots. I have regular... You've got mascots right here. I've got an irritant. Well, that too. Oh, okay. I have some mini marshmallows here 
that are double bagged because these ones are in uh, cocoa. Because we need some dark features as well, do we not? You know I can end up with this stuff all over the place, but I'll try not to do that. Okay, so step one, let's open the bag. <laughs> it's the S'more Man. I swear when I booked Brian tonight, I had no idea what he was going to do. I'm a patient man. All right. Maybe we do need a... No, I'm not going to put a paper now. I put it on the floor, but... All right. Ooh, come on. So what we're going to do is... Most of the uh, light areas that you see on the uh, surface of the moon are highland regions. Are those verified as... Are they real? Yeah, they're disgusting. That makes it a more All right. Here we go. So following my map, all right, can you see my map? I've got my map over here. So following the map now, I'm just going to start shoving things into place. Get some highland regions here. And something I discovered, I actually did the, a dry run of this. I discovered that I needed a lot more dark area than I'd actually worked with. Okay, let's build this up right in here. Let's pull that down, something like that. Something like that. Get a few more down here. You notice toward the southern region of the moon, it's mostly highland area. And as I've mentioned before, the makeup of this is very similar to what uh, is in coffee mate that you put in your coffee. It's just a slightly higher aluminum content on what you find on the moon. So lots of highlands here. No Scottish bagpipes in these highlands, though. Aww. All right. Okay, now I just need a little bit over here. This way, and then I'm going to start carving out some areas here. I need a little bit of dark. I need a dark line along here, because that's going to be the area of the frozen sea, Mari Fergaris. So let's just pour a few more, and then I'll, I'll pull the Mari right out of that. Okay, here we go. Let's get the edge of the moon there. Okay. Now I want to pull out the Sea of Serenity. All right. And this is some of the areas that we were looking at from, uh, from Murray when he was doing his uh, Great Lunar Challenge there. I better pull some over here. And I find I'm always robbing from Peter to pay Paul with this, but all right. We need a little dark area over here for Mari Chrysium, the Sea of Crises. And let's pull out the Sea of Fertility, the Sea of Tranquility here. Okay. And, well, the Nectaris Basin, I'll just chuck those out of the way there. Okay. I haven't made a very good, okay. Sea of Serenity up here. Let's make a bigger Tranquility base. All right, it'll get easier once they start putting the dark ones in. All right, that's for starters. Now let's start adding some of the Mare basalt. Can you pass the basalt, please? No. That's a, that's a little uh, salt and pepper joke. Okay, so now I can start putting these things in. You rock, man. All right, so we'll start over on the western limb of the moon, and all of this is Oceanus Procellarum, the ocean of storms. And it comes Oceanus Cocolarum. There it comes. Uh, we need the Imbrium Basin, 3.8 billion years old. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use this one right up here because in the north part of uh, the Imbrium Basin, we have the dark crater Plato. So I'll stick that right there. I kind of have run out of space here, so I'll just shove that out of the way. Let's put the frozen sea, Mari Fergoris. Across the top. Dinner. Is anybody getting hungry? The reason I'm using gloves, of course, is that uh, I'm going to be presenting this to uh, Ann Fraser. Ann and Art, of course, handle all the grub outside when we're having coffee and snacks. And they'll be able to put that right on the table there. So if you have a mind, you can come and snack from this. All right, so now I'm going to come down. We're going to come down to the area of Mare Humorum, the Sea of Humors. And this is where the crater Gassendi is, that crater sketch that I did. Okay, I'll bring that down there. And over here, it comes down into the Sea of Clouds, Mare Nubium. Don't forget Palace Mallow, right? Yeah, Palace that's right. Mallow. I like that. The Marsh of Mallow. That's very good, actually, Paul. Because the palace, of course, Palace 
uh, Putridinus, that, uh, well, that was the area near where uh, Murray Campbell was showing us, that, that dark area coming in the, uh, what did you call it? It was the plateau coming in toward the Apollo 15 landing site, all that dark area. So a palace is a, is a marsh, so a marsh mallow, very good. And we need, over on the western uh, limb of the moon, is the darkest feature on the moon, it's the crater Grimaldi. So I'll just stick Grimaldi on top. There's marshmallow hiding underneath there. I'm not sure what the significance of that is. So if you leave this long enough, you get the crater Grimaldi. <laughs> okay, that works, that works. So now I'm gonna put a little bit of uh, just ejector rays here. I'm working in negative now because I can't put light stuff on top of this, but the crater uh, Tycho is right down here. Let's, here, we'll pretend Tycho's a little bit dark. There it is right there. Okay, now, here we go. Sea of Serenity. Comes right in here. Then it goes right into Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. So the Apollo 11 astronauts landed on this marshmallow right about here. <laughs> Over on the side, we need Mare Chrysium, the Sea of Crises. I'll just pitch that in like that. The Sea of Crispies? I wonder where that one was supposed to be. I'll just pull it over there. Okay, so the Sea of <coughs> Fertility comes down that way. Makes one lake coming down. And the Nectaris Basin, the Sea of Nectar comes down that way. So I think what I want to do is steal a couple of these white ones, put that in there. So if you squint, it sort of looks like it, does it not? Can you seal that up for me, please? Okay. But wait. But wait. But wait, there's more. I feel like that slap chop guy. Order in the next 12 minutes, right? It slices, it dices. I forgot to throw it over your shoulder. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, well, that, yeah, chuck it, right? Can you open up? Thank you. All right. Now, what I have in this bag, uh, they may look. Oh, you're going to take one, I knew you were going to take one. That's why I brought extras. These are Reese's Minis. Peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. I can, I'm can. i not allowed to eat either one of these, but you know what? I I'm stole doing one. I'm doing it for them. But what I noticed was the shape of this... Let's see if I can get it under the light. I'm not very uh, dexterous here. The shape of this reminded me of the lunar descent stage from the Apollo uh, <laughs> spacecraft. So, since we can now see them in photographs, let's go. All right, here we are in the Sea of Tranquility. <whistles> Apollo 11. The Eagle has landed. The Eagle has landed. The Reese has landed. All right, so that's where Apollo 11 landed. Now, Apollo 12, what the heck is going on here? This yeah, good. needs to be bumped out a bit. Mm -hmm. All right, Apollo 12. Landed over here. Apollo 13. Dimmed. Dimmed. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Apollo 14 went where Apollo 13 was supposed to go at the Mari Fra, uh, Mar Fra Maro. Brian, we have a problem. Here. We have a problem. <laughs> right? So we have 11, 12, 14. <laughs> Apollo 15 that Murray showed us, of course, in the Apennine Mountains. What the heck is this lump here? I consult my chart. Oh, I can see it's Mari Imbrim. So that means right at the edge of Mari Imbrim. I know what's wrong here. We need mounds. We need uh, Hadley Delta. Oh, I can put Hadley Delta, but yeah, I think you ate it. <laughs> We're missing Burp. the little sea of vapors here ah. that has Hyginus Rill in it. We can't forget that because that's where the crater Julius Caesar oh, is. That's so. why you're wearing your gloves, so it can be Hyginus. Roger that. Yeah. Okay, so we've got 11, 12, 14, 15. Apollo 16 in the Descartes Highlands here, and Apollo 17 around the moon, around the moon, around the moon, boop, in the Taurus littoral region, just at the base of uh, the Sea of Serenity, just at the top of the Sea of Tranquility. So here we have now a full moon. Now you're going to be able to check this for yourselves because we'll be putting this out in the lobby, have a good look at it, and then run outside because there was a nice moon that was coming up, and I want you to compare what you've seen here with what you see in the sky. All right, so here we have, uh, here we have the frozen sea, we have the Imbrian Basin, we have the ocean of storms, we have the uh, sea of humors, we have the sea of clouds coming down here, we have the sea of nectar, the sea of fertility, the sea of crises, oh, crises, but we balance that with 
the sea of tranquility, and even better, the sea of serenity. Plus, some nice edible little spacecraft. <laughs> and I think that's all she wrote. Yo, where's the cheese? Where's the cheese? Oh well, it's uh, <coughs> this is the uh, lower fat moon. <coughs> yeah, the green, the greening of the moon, right? It'll get green over the next few weeks. So, Anne, are your hands free, please? Forget my one thumb, just pushing okay, that, doing that. In Inspired by uh, by Brian's work here, I'd like to hand out one more door prize. I'd like to surprise people with door prizes because too many people are leaving just after door prizes. I have an advanced astrophotography system, a bag of Smarties. They should be able to render globular clusters with this very nicely. <laughs> For the holder of magic ticket number 279. All right, all that remains is for me to tell you what uh, good stuff is going to be coming up in the next month in terms of entertainment. Uh, right after now, you get to eat the uh, goodies, some of which Brian has prepared for you in real time. <coughs> and, uh, and caffeine and carbohydrates provided by Ann and Art Fraser. This is also a good time to uh, talk to our speakers if you'd like to ask more questions. Um, <coughs> Al Scott is going to be selling uh, tickets for the annual dinner meeting. The dinner meeting is going to be November 13th at uh, Algonquin College. I understand that the food is quite good. And we also have a special guest speaker, Professor René Dion of the University de Montréal, who uh, apparently was one of the first person to take photographs of exoplanets. And he's also going to be talking about uh, his work with the uh, tunable filter on the uh, Webb Space Telescope. Um, <coughs> after the meeting, some of us go to, um, to uh, Kelsey's for those who want to continue conversation over alcohol and uh, cheesy bits. Uh, on the 12th, as uh, I'd just like to reiterate, um, we're going to have a, a star party organized by Michael Mongerheim at the CARP Library, solar observing and night observing. I'm going to try to bring my 25-inch for the night part, which means that people who come will have no excuse not to try the um, Einstein's Cross Observing Challenge. I said, if people want to try it, bring their own star chart because there's a pretty good chance that the two computers and uh, 14 cables and three batteries and, and uh, 24 configuration options of my telescope, something will screw up and I won't be able to point the telescope with GoTo. Um, in parallel, uh, Mike uh, Earl is going to have a star party at the Mill of Kintail, which is the same property as the, our uh, Fred Lossing Observatory Telescope, but they have a much nicer washroom. Um, <laughs> it's true. On the, uh, on the 18th, this is in conjunction with a uh, course, an astronomy course that Mike teaches at the uh, gatehouse, but he has a public star party afterwards. The skies are darker here, but the ten there tend to be fewer people coming. <laughs> And on the 9th, we have another star party organized by Mark, Mike Mogenham at the uh, CARP Library for night observing. <clears throat> and the next meeting will be on October the, uh, the 2nd. By the way, the, uh, the October meeting is booking up very quickly, so if uh, there are people here who would like to present, talk to me soon. I already have a and an Eclipse uh, trip uh, booked and some real si two talks on real science content. Um, there were, I believe, 132 people here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Unfortunately, it took 168 emails to organize this, so I'd like you to bring 24 more friends next time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to thank everyone who helped, especially uh, Chris Tarrant, who did a huge amount of work on the PowerPoint presentations, even though he had to leave for New York this morning. And actually to uh, Frank Barrell, who, who drove across town twice in order to deliver video files that were too big for us to email and uh, Tim Cole for setting up and operating, and everyone else who spent a considerable amount of time preparing slides and researching material. Thank you all very much. That's the meeting. <laughs>